there, listeners. Welcome to another episode of the Snowy's Camping Show, joined by myself and Lauren, as usual. Um, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel um, via your po- favourite podcast app, or you can do it via YouTube, and you can join in on the conversation in the Snowy's uh, Camping Show Facebook group, and, and also on YouTube, YouTube comments and YouTube community. Yep. Now, I'm kind of excited about today's episode, because this, is, this yeah. is the first in what we're hoping is what we're planning on being a series of um, fridge focused episodes in pulling fridge brands in um, to speak to them about their brand, their fridges, the technologies they use Um, because fridges are always, it's a big, big um, uh, category within snowies and And a big commitment as well. Big commitment. And yeah. So being a big commitment, a lot of time spent wondering what should I buy? What's the best, et cetera, et cetera. And every brand's got their own, you know, pros and, and cons, um, nothing's ever going to be a hundred percent right. But, mm-hmm. um, but we thought if we speak to each brand, then everyone can get we a We want an opportunity more. to give every brand direct from their mouth information about why they yep. think their fridge is the best. And yep. then that way, if you're looking for a fridge, you can listen and you can make your own determinations right. from that. Basically. And, we, and you've asked, um, you uh, asked our list uh, or, our, um, Facebook, um, and YouTube group people yep. and YouTube, um, Community, I'm mixing my words here, um, some questions too. So at the end of this, we've got some questions Listen for questions. our guest from today who is from Dometic. And on the line, we've got Paul Montau. Now, I did just ask how to Monto. pronounce that. Monto. <laughs> and I've got it wrong already. It was only like, what, three <laughs> minutes you, ago and I've already messed it up. <laughs> how are you, Paul? I'm good, thank you. Good morning, Ben. Good morning, Lauren. Thank you very much for having me on your show. No Thanks for worries. joining us. Um, so, Paul, give us a rundown. Um, obviously, you're from Dometic. Give us a rundown on, on who you are, your history with the company and all that sort of jazz. Yeah, sure, Lauren. So, so my current role is on the global product manager for mobile cooling. So the mobile cooling division within Dometic encompasses our compressor fridges, in the good, better, and best category. Mm-hmm. Our ice boxes, which were generally in the better and best category in what you call the rotor molded ice boxes. Our thermoelectric coolers, um, soft bags, and drinkware. So that encapsulates what, I, what I'm responsible for as global product manager. So what does that mean? I'm looking for where we want to go with our roadmap where we want to change and how often we need to change our model range. You know, you, you see a model range uh, uh, as a series or a changeover every five to six years. It costs a okay. lot to produce compressor coolers. There's a lot of value in the tooling to create those those products. So you need to, enough years to, to recoup some of, some of that. So in range planning, as I said, the product manager's responsibility is to work out what the consumer wants. So I'm looking for, for feedback in the marketplace, on what new features, uh, what what unique selling points we might want to bring into a product for a future range and when to introduce introduce that. So that's what I do as the global product manager. I've been there uh, since 2015 in, De- in Dometic when Dometic purchased Waco. Before that, I was actually part of Waco since 2005. Okay. And in the role at Waco, I was doing, um, I was doing sales, uh, state manager for WA, South Australia and Northern Territory. And then I started getting very much involved in in giving input into what I would like to see in fridges and coolers of the future. And I guess that segued me into this uh, role as global product manager. That's nice. that's pretty exciting because I imagine, you know, when you started at Waco, um, like where am I going with this train of thought? So for me, like obviously you start off at Snowy's and, you know, you love the brand and you love the company you work for and you'd like to be there long term. And then, you know, you're still essentially involved in that same company 15 years later, but you're in a position where you can actively contribute to the direction of that company and your creative mm. ideas and all that sort of jazz. That must be something that feels really good for you, especially yeah, if, yeah. You, if you love what you do. Yeah, categorically, Lauren, yeah, 17 years in and I still love it every time we launch a product. It's like it's like yeah. having a baby every time you have, <laughs> yeah. a, have a new product go to market because you've done so much work in the background and you're so excited to launch something. Yeah. And, you know, there's been a lot of lot of security and secrecy about the new range of yeah. things coming and then you finally get it to marketplace and you when you're at your first trade show and you're dealing direct with consumers or we're coming to you to present the new product range for, for your next season, it, it's wonderful to see the response and yeah. and get the feedback from both customer and consumer. That's I can great. imagine I can imagine that would be a joy. So a bit of a 
history of the Dometic brand because when I started at Snowy's, it was Waco and I think um, Dometic was associated with Waco and then there was this kind of evolution where it was Waco by Dometic and then the Dometic Waco and then uh, slowly the Waco, and I thought it was quite cleverly done, the Waco brand just sort of disappeared but the fridges stayed as the same sort of recognisable fridge. Um, but was was Dometic associated with refrigeration prior to Waco? Yeah, so uh, D- D- Dometic actually was was probably the leaders in refrigeration, but in a different in a in a different technology. Dometic have always been about gas absorption refrigerators, and you, if you remember, okay. right back into the sixties and seventies, before compressor technology really took off, the old kerosene fridges that our yeah. parents would have had, or our, or or our grandparents, that they were based on absorption technology that's been around since the eighteen hundreds when they first started refrigeration with our uh, Peltasar and, and Bolta. So it's been uh, it's been a technology that Dometic got into very very early because. Dometic was an offshoot of Electrolux in the 1960s. Okay. And Electrolux were doing refrigeration and vacuum cleaners and other Electrolux products many, many moons ago. But Electrolux, because they did refrigeration and gas was always often on board in the caravan and RV industry, the caravan and RV industry went to Electrolux and asked for refrigerators that they could put in caravans in in the 50s and 60s. Okay. So... Dometic started making a range of, uh, oh, sorry, Electrolux started making a range of refrigerators for the RV industry, and it just took off from there. It became such a big business in the oh. RV side of it that they spun that business out as Dometic as its own entity and sold it off to private equity companies, and that's how okay. Dometic came to be. So. As well as that, Dometic then found because they owned refrigeration and had so much technology and absorption, their other big part of their business was actually doing silent mini bars for for the motel and high end hotel industry, yeah, and right. also mini bars for cruise ships. So there's a massive side business which is related to uh, hospitality and lodging. So you've got uh, mini bars, safes uh, going into uh, hotels and into into cruise ships. So it generates a huge amount of volume for the business and expertise in cooling and refrigeration. So yeah. was mm. sorry to interrupt. So was Dometic actually because Dometic is an international brand, is that correct? Yes. And correct. when or everything that you're talking about historically with RVs and cruise ships and hotels and all that, was that within Australia still at that yeah, stage? Yep, yeah. since the nineteen sixties. Okay. Australia's been supplying R V refrigerators to the industry. And that was one, only one part of uh, of what they do, we talked about the mini bars and the uh, and the safes. But of course, if you're in RVs, mm. there was there was a huge amount of product: rooftop air conditioners, mm. um, the uh, toilet systems, awnings, windows, doors, the the cook the cookers, the stoves, the ovens, yeah. a myriad of uh, of product within the Dometic brand for the RV industry. Yeah. I, I did want to make one other quick point sure. because it's something that you're that that. You're, uh, you're not that we'd have older listeners. Uh, listeners of my <laughs> right. would remember <laughs> would be that uh, Dometic in Australia actually had a gentleman based out of Brendale in uh, Queensland working on absorption and refrigeration. And this, this gen- gentleman, Peter Wishart, uh, made the F400 RC 1180, which was really some of the first chest portable camping fridges ever made in the world because it's very hard in the absorption industry, sorry, absorption technology, to to be able to get freezing capabilities if you haven't got the height. So the height allows you on the gas absorber to Mm. get your freezing capabilities. But if you think about the um, F400 and RC1180, and your listeners might remember them because they were a big green box and a big blue box with a, that, that, that worked on gas. And they were hugely popular until compressor technology t- took over. Right. That's really, um, I love that you said that because these are two things which aren't really related to refrigeration, but cool anyway. One, Brendale is where we have our second snowy yeah. store. And two, Wishart is my name. No oh, way. It's, it's, don't tell me <laughs> Peter Wishart's your dad. <laughs> he's, he's not my dad, no. But um, it's, so, it's, I just thought that was a funny little coincidence in that story. Thanks for sharing that one. So when, when a Dometic, uh, it was obviously in Australia before taking over Waco, um, but Waco was a separate company and was that? It, sound, it sounds like the move to Waco was Dometic's or the, the takeover of Waco was Dometic's move to that 12-volt compressor market. Prior to that, well, you didn't have any yeah. of those products? 
Exactly, Ben. You picked it up co- correctly because Dometic hadn't had any expertise in compressor products. They tried to do one little 35 compressor and had no cut through with that. So then they went out looking as a private equity company, as they do, and as they still do, they look, they look, they were out looking to make an acquisition of a, of a company to, to bring into the brand rather than recreate the wheel buy an existing brand in in the marketplace. Waco in Australia had been going since 1999. Waco started in Australia. Waco in Europe had been going through since the 1968, 1969. So there was a long history of uh, of starting with compressor coolers there. Uh, Dometic was looking around the world for a business that had had global global reach. Waco at that stage was well established in Europe well-established in Australia, starting to get established in Southeast Asia and hadn't hadn't got any any reach into the American market at that point. Dometic was quite strong in the American market and thought they could bring this brand in quite quite easily. So in uh, 2015, they put Dometic put their hands in their pockets and purchased the Waco business outright, including the uh, the main construction factories in uh, Southeast China, in Zhuhai and Shenzhen, uh, including all of the engineering staff, all of the sales staff, all the distribution sites globally. Wow. Uh, so yeah, a, a a massive purchase for Dometic, but. They managed to bring in then uh, an expertise in mobile cooling and compressor refrigeration, and obviously more revenue for the for the total for the total business. So quite a good move on their part to to just bring that in. So they knew the Waco brand had brand equity within Australia and a little bit within within EMEA. Mm-hmm. So and we did a really good transition plan. I'm glad you picked it up, Ben, that we had that transition there. And it was the idea was that we went from Waco and we launched the very first CFX range under the Waco CFX range. So it was Waco CFX. And we used the CFX code as the link between Waco and Dometic. So then we went, as you said, um, uh, Waco by Dometic, and within that we did the CFX range as Dometic Waco CFX, mm-hmm. and then over over the five or six year period we've now dropped the Waco and it's Dometic CFX. So that's mm-hmm. where the lineage goes right back to the history of Waco. And uh, yeah, there's, there's still there's still the engineers that build the products in our, in our factories are still the same engineers. But I guess the big thing about the change is uh, is economy of scale. You've got Waco as as this size business being gobbled up by a business that's this large, yeah. and what that brings with it is a level of expertise that, that the Waco business couldn't have brought to its brought to bear itself. You've got the ability to apply uh, the the engineering ability of the 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 global mobile cooling team and the global refrigeration team together. You've got the ability to have um, the designers that we have in Germany and Sweden doing the design work. You know, we, we pick up a lot of ex-automotive um, designers from, from Audi, from Volvo, from BMW. So we get a lot of quality design style and guide within to the into the product range to try mm. and loop it all back to the to the Dometic brand language. So having that benefit of going to a larger company gave that that uh, compressor fridge the ability to expand in both technology, uh, um, quality, and performance, which would have taken the Waco business by itself a little bit longer, I believe. Well, all that ref- reflects strongly in the product itself because it is probably one of the the sleekest looking fridges I yeah. think on the on the shelf. And the new nice fridge covers and, and everything they're and, very very different. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, I just want to sort of we we we'll segue into talking more about the specific fridges themselves here in, and yep. in no particular order really but um we've talked a lot about you know compressor fridges and moving into Waco expanding that compressor uh market can you talk to me about Dometic's own compressor? Because obviously you have compressors like Danfoss, um, Seacott now it's known as and whatever. And I think that historically within the camping and four-wheel drive industry, those um, those They're known, and trusted. known brands of compressors are known and trusted. And then when you look at a fridge that says, oh, you know, um, you know, this brand's own own named compressor and whatever, there's a lot of – mysteriousness around yeah. what that actually means and why it's yeah. any good. So um, talk to me about that for you guys. Yeah, absolutely, because, yeah, you, you are correct. For, for the, the compressor is the heart and soul of the of the driving device for that. So 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 just to give, give back a little bit of back history, the reason that Waco used 
the the Danfoss in those days, the Danfoss BDF thirty five and and uh, the the BD the larger BD fifty compressors. The reason they used those is there was quite a lot of interaction between the engineers in mobile in in Waco and the engineers at. Danfoss. I can't remember if it was because the vicinity of the factories in Germany were quite close okay. or whether there was a relationship there. But there was a lot of back and forth because in those days, Danfoss wanted to have the best performing um, low voltage DC, DC compressor. And of course, Waco wanted the lowest lowest voltage performance on, on theirs as well. So they're not drawing so much power. So there was a lot of interaction in those days between the Danfoss compressor team and the Waco engineers as well to to build this this development in um in in the compressor technology and one of the things that sort of started to come about was the ability to um couple the compressor rather than just running on and off flat out starting and and running running it running it full speed and and then switching off they started to use what we would call fuzzy logic a little bit like you see in your washing machines a little bit like you see in your in your air conditioners instead of going like that it, it has a, a a slower ramp up then a higher speed, then a, then a step down, and uh, no, you you hear terms like AEO, which is uh, synonymous to Danfoss and the uh, and the CCOP, which is adaptive energy optimization. And then we did our own software program in our controllers called VMSO, Variable Motor Speed Optimization. Now we've been using that for fifteen or sixteen years now. We're up to VMSO Mark Three, so we're tweaking the algorithms within the control of the compressor to ensure that the compressor is able to to get to the maximum or the quickest set temp the set temperature at the quickest rate using the lowest possible power draw. So that's what that that algorithm is about. Now we started to do that development very, very early on with, with Danfoss. Then um, CCOP, a very large um, compressor company, a little bit like uh, Dometic by and Waco, you've got CCOP, a large AC or 240 volt compressor company wanting to get into low voltage compressors. So they bought the that part of the uh, the, the CCOP business outright. So that's when CCOP went to went to Danfoss, and they they brought that uh, that whole business into the the CCOP side of of compressors. Mm. All, all well and good, but for us, we lost that relationship mm. on that R and D development with the engineers at Danfoss because Danfoss closed down their compressor systems completely. Now they're doing switching of pumps, so okay. Danfoss is still a going business, but they have no compressor voltage that I compressors that I know of, yeah, and that's okay. all within the CCOP because we didn't have. A relationship with CCOP, and we couldn't c- continue that relationship with them to try and develop the the the, the CCOP BDF thirty five and BDF fifty to the next level that we wanted to. Okay. So within our within our factories in um in uh, the the Pearl River Delta, the special Ep- economic zone of China, we we had um we had a, a compressor factory that was quite renowned uh, called Wambau, and we went into the joint venture with them. So we did a joint venture with them to, to produce our own Dometic compressors. So then we got to put all that information, all that engineering design that we had into those compressors and, and put them up against the CCOP, and we were very happy with the performance. It was very similar performance, maybe slightly quieter as well. And, of course, because we're building them ourselves, we're able to have control of what we're doing with those compressors and do the development on them. So a lot of things have happened in Mm. those years. I think the most important things for your um, uh, uh, audience to understand is there is no such thing as a Stanfoss compressor anymore. And it's it when people say it has a CCOP compressor and it doesn't, it has a it has a Danfoss compressor that was formerly CCOP. You can use right. those terminologies, but when okay. you see people marketing the word Danfoss compressor, well, unless Danfoss have opened up a new business that we don't know <laughs> about and are making <laughs> compressors now and haven't contacted us, it's not a Danfoss compressor. It's CCOP, and nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Nothing yeah. wrong that it's a CCOP com- compressor. We use CCOP compressors in in some of our some of our um, our, our level down products as well, and we use we're looking at their, their new developments as well. They everybody's in compressors is about to improve performance, mm-hmm. reducing the noise, and yep. reducing the weight. And so we're we're doing that. But what it gives us in compressors, it gives us total control if we want to improve things or make a change. And I guess that's the 
big difference between yeah. our products and many others. You've got a couple of people, a couple of um, uh, uh, fridge manufacturers out there that have control of their own compressor, but most fridge manufacturers are just going to a compressor manufacturer, taking what they can, working with it to get to get it to the best the best performance that they can yeah. do. Yeah, but um, we don't have that control. So a bit of a long story. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 it's, it's, it's to good. dispel the myths and give the story as to why. Theoretically, I guess if CCOP had never taken on Danfoss, we may still be today yep. taking taking the taking the Danfoss compressor, and we would have hopefully between us stepped it up to a level that it would would be would be uh, really incredible. Mm. Well, it's great um, variable compressor um, VS VS variable motor speed optimization um, VMSI has certainly proved itself over the past. Um, what did you say? Is it, uh, how many years is it now? Two thousand fifteen. Yeah, two thousand fifteen. So, yeah, yeah, long time now, um, but. Even more so to know that some of that uh, Danfoss knowledge is is so closely related to the development of the compressor in your fridge because it is the heart of the fridge and it's a common question that everyone asks around what compressor does it run. So yeah, I want to. Yeah. You mentioned um, quietness before, and obviously Dometic, I would say in my experience and and working in this industry, is known to be the most quiet um, twelve twenty four volt yeah. fridge on the market. Is there other elements to the design of the fridge that goes into that? instead of just the compressor? Like what other contributing yeah, so, factors so, are there? So, so, so a little bit is making sure that we, the, some of the noise of the compressor, you're always going to get a little bit of noise from the impeller. But within the compressor, like you said, we, we do actually inc- in, increase the thickness of the casing to try and re- reduce the noise of the of the impeller spinning around in, inside there. The, a lot of the other noise is actually really not noise from the compressor. It's actually harmonics within the, within the machine cabinet or the fan noise. So if there's yeah. something caught in a fan, you often some people complain about the noise, but it's actually cat hair or uh, bits of their blanket or, yeah, right. or something okay. caught up in the <laughs> okay. fan, okay. creating creating a, a, a bit of noise. So we work very hard to try and reduce that. The other thing is to stop the uh, the vibration or harmonics within the vehicle. We shock mount the compressors on on rubber boots so that the compressors have that. So when you're doing hardcore four wheel driving, you've got mm. you've yeah. got some given some movement, mm-hmm. and secondly, it's not going to create any any harmonics within the within the fridge as well. So there's a few a few factors there, and up de- designing it so that the compressor is spaced correctly within the machine compartment is, is really is really critical to reducing the noise. Uh, but everybody is is working on that because it's about sustainability mm. is is high on our agenda of the way we do business. We want to have least amount of uh, power draw. We want to be as quiet as possible and use sustainable materials. So there's a, a lot a lot happening in the background on compressor development. So what else is there on a Dometic fridge that sets, in your view, sets you apart from the others? Yeah, I guess, in, in, especially for the Australian audience, in the, in the Australian market, w- what has always set Dometic apart, be it it's, it's portable refrigeration or it's RV products, is actually – the support and service network behind it. You can't go anywhere in Australia to be more than two or three hours away from a service agent. We have 250 service and support agents Australia-wide. Heaven forbid you break your lead, you drop your fridge. Well, we often have people trying to bring things in, in on the warranty that have been submerged in the water <laughs> and actually <laughs> drop, them, drop them between boats and uh, full of salt water and sand. Wow. But if something happens, it goes to a service agent and they have the ability to affect the repair there because we carry the spare parts within, within the three distribution centres that we have in Australia and we can get you back on the road as quickly as quickly as possible, get it repaired and moving. So that's the that's the first part. The service and support network for Dometic is 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 second to none within the uh, within the Australian marketplace. We don't ask you to ship it back to the to anywhere else in yep. Australia and then we they make a determination and you may cost you a cost you this and that. We yeah. just ask you to bring it into us, <clears throat> have a look at it under warranty, and we'll, uh, we'll 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 give a determination and get it fixed really quick for you. The other thing that that sets it apart, as besides the design language and the style, and I often I have to say, wow, the CFX three, it's probably even too pretty. A lot of people actually think <laughs> it's so beautiful. It's trying to scratch it up. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's so beautiful. It, it may it, it may may hide its ruggedness, but uh, but but we have those fenders on them and the side frames to 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 keep that. The other thing is we pack. A lot of features and benefits, and a lot of unique selling points into the into the product for the price. So when you're at our premium level, when you're at our best level, when you're buying a CFX three, you're getting 
all of the usual features that you would see with any any other compressor fridge. You're getting the drain plugs, you're getting the nice dial, you're getting the fold down handles, but you're also getting one of the only uh, user interfaces that's a that's a uh, like a, a, pr- a proper proper display. It's 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 uh, interactive. It's got color and it matches what you've got on your uh, on your app as well. And you've got app control. The other thing is the app control not only just gives you control, it gives you monitor as well. Very few of the apps monitor the power draw, and we've got the facility to show you your power draw by the last hour, by the last day, by the last week. So you can actually see what your fridge is doing. So there's there's that as as an extra feature within the CFX3 free range. But I guess that's that's the other thing about Dometic. Because of the performance – because of the work that we've done on compressor, because of the work that we've done on insulation, because of the work that we've done on ventilation, and remind me to talk about ventilation at a later point because okay. that's a mission critical one to performance. Um, because of all the things that have been that have been done there, it means that we are so proud of our performance and our energy ratings that we publish our energy ratings on every document that you see, on every catalog, on the website. We clearly state what the energy consumption of this product is at, at, a, at a given set of inv- at a given set of circumstances, which stuff, is yep. 32 degrees ambient temperature for a for a 24 hour period. So 32 degrees ambient, which is a pretty hot day. You think it might get cooler than that in the evenings, but it's 32 degrees constant with the freezer set at minus 15 if it's a freezer or a dual zone, and the fridge set at set at four degrees. So we do that testing and publish it everywhere yep. and say to them, this is what we draw. You know, some of them are drawing you know, 0. 0.98, 1.03, 0.902, variations within within there, but we publish it down to the to the to point zero of a of a uh, of an amp. So you can see exactly what it's drawing on 12 volt. Few of the other companies will do that. They'll, they'll publish it. Most don't publish it because they're not going to be able to beat the level of the Dometic CFX or the CFF there. They and you, you could argue that it doesn't matter because it's all about one amp an hour anyway. Mm. Most fridges are going to draw about one amp an hour. Yeah. But when it comes to performance, that's that's I think that's the key thing that many of the other suppliers uh, are not prepared to to uh, disclose their power draw under the same set of circumstances because it will be very hard to beat. And that's the key thing when you're away camping for a, for a period of time. You want your you want your fridge to be running for the longest possible period on your 12-volt battery. So, you know, the point, point ones, the point two of an amp an hour, all start to build up over a week or a three week or if you're static camping for a period of time yeah. and you don't have a lot of sun and your solar's running down and you're, you're panicking about your battery <laughs> levels, as we probably all, as we probably all yeah, have, yeah. it's really, yeah, really for important. Sure. For, for, for the battery door. So that's one of the other the other key features about about Dometic is we're proud enough to publish our exact performance under under the given circumstances up against anybody else in the world. Uh, and and a couple of the, the most recent technological uh, fridge reviews have have proved that. I sent you a link previously. I don't know if you want to put that in your in your in the bottom of the bottom of the chat yeah, later on. Well, the last show notes really good sure. fridge test that was done. Uh, a lot of people think they do fridge tests and uh, they do it, but they, they, you really need to get. The, the the correct meterage and the correct voltage and the correct the, the items if you're going to measure measure performance of fridges yeah. but there was a really good fridge test done by Overland magazine and uh there's quite some interesting results and some common brands for both Australia and the American market were test were tested in there and the uh the CFX355 ice maker came up, out on top of, well. all, of all of that uh from from that from that test and that was again a lot of it was based on performance, and that's where that's where they, these these products shine shine through. You're getting you, you you're getting a fantastic performance level for the for the price and the value that that you bring bring to bear. Yeah. Okay. Um. You let's circle back to ventilation. Yeah, ventilation and, and, right, and yeah. insulation. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if they go hand in hand. And we'll touch on that insulation and and flammability component as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So 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 ventilation. Uh, it, we, we all like because I'm a, I'm a four wheel driver and a free camper, so I like to pack as much gear into my car as I possibly can. I have a rooftop tent, I, I so I can move quickly, so I don't pitch pitch. So uh, I, I'm the same. So we're packing a lot of gear into the back of our car. Yep. So uh, the the fridge needs to have some air to be able to breathe. What happens is when we when we pack a lot of stuff around our fridge, if we start to uh, lose the space around the ventilation area, and this can be any product. This is not related to uh, 
to, to diminish. This is related to uh, refrigeration in general. If it's a yep. compressor fridge, it needs to breathe. You can't pack your mattresses up. You can't pack all your gear up and, and, and expect the fridge to operate at its optimal performance. Yeah. And that's when we start to find um, people have high power draw when they have them locked inside um, some of uh, the camper trailers where it's locked in the fridge locker and the fridge locker hasn't been ventilated. Mm. So the fridge the fridge has got no fresh air coming in and nowhere for the hot air to escape. It's just then recirculating hot air around the around the cooling system and, yeah. and venting it back out. And then instead of doing its duty cycle, and a duty cycle is where fridge comes on, checks the temperature, doesn't run if it doesn't need to. It actually runs flat out, and you'll see that there's there's lots of um, incidences of fridges running flat out all the time, drawing a lot of power, and that's usually about poor ventilation. Right. As long as you can keep the air coming in and the hot air going out, you're always going to get much better performance. So don't block the vents. Try and park in the shade. Don't lock it in a car in the sun with the windows wound up because <laughs> it will get it will get to up to you know seventy two degrees inside yeah. your car with the windows locked up on a forty degree day. Yeah, and, it will. And, and we know it. We've been seeing those all the time. Yeah. So it's, and it's, it's the same, getting hot. Same for any fridge. Like it's, it's the same. It, it needs same it needs ventilation to, to operate you need, as you need, efficiently as you they need, can. You need ventilation to help you out. And I think some people forget that, and they they wonder why their fridge is drawing too much power. They wonder why why it's not staying cold. Why it may switch off because it gets thermal overload. They wonder all these things. Yeah. But the reality is, you know, yeah, would you would you put your Expect any your home fridge to work in like yeah. seventy two degrees ambient. It's sitting there at home yeah. at twenty five degrees. You've got to give it a a, a, a bit of ventilation to help yeah, it out. They all specify space around the fridge for the same reason. The home yeah. fridge, so yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and you mentioned earlier with insulation and flammability rules. I yeah, didn't quite yeah. understand so, it all, but so um, so yeah, insulation is is one thing. I mean, obviously your insulation properties and the thickness of your insulation properties and what you can do, what kind of foams you use, whether you use um whether you use vacuum insulated panels in your walls, there's lots of ways to do that. But um interestingly um, th- there's just been a new rule. So a lot of the, a lot of uh, the suppliers are, are chasing w- what's called in Australia, it's called uh, A2 flammability. So it's the new legislation relating to all refrigeration, not mobile cooling or not compressive fridges in Australia, but every fridge. So for Whirlpool, for Sanyo, for, for uh, or Fisher and Paykel and uh, uh, everybody that has a domestic fridge, uh, there's been a new international ruling after the Grenville fire disaster of the flats that burnt down, I think in the early 2000s, there was a massive fire that was started by an upright refrigerator in somebody's home. Mm. And since then, they've adopted this new new ruling regarding um, insulating or having a barrier between the engine compartment and the insulation material of the fridges, which accelerated the fire in the Granville fire disaster, oh, and then that went out to the cladding on the outside, and it got it was terrible. So that was um, that was a, uh, a a a ruling that took place in the in about two thousand and three internationally, uh, but Australia signed up to go early. Uh, most people were supposed to be around about two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. Us being good corporate citizens, <laughs> Australia went went July one, two thousand and five. So we then had to scramble to create a, a range of products that met that standard by using um because traditionally we've used a uh, a a plastic material as a PP for the for the uh, for the outer housing and the and and some foam insulation on the inside. So then we had to find a uh, a, a plastic insulation property that met. What, what we call 5VA materials, so plastic materials that are fire resistant. So we had to had to scramble down that path. So we had to do that, or you have to put metal plates in. You've got to put uh, um, uh, barriers between the engine compartment and the uh-huh. uh, and the insulation properties. So ourselves and many of the other manufacturers went down this um, A2 path of flat flammability to to meet to meet the global standards. Our concern is uh, certainly. That the big suppliers have, have all done that. Some of the some of the suppliers have thought the legislation is a big ambiguous. Uh, we thought, like many, it wouldn't apply to mobile cooling. We didn't think it'd be part of your car fridge. But yeah. when, when we asked for an exemption, it, would, it wasn't forthcoming for any of the fridge suppliers. So all the fridge suppliers have had to go down this path of uh, of creating this, uh, creating this, uh, and meeting this standard. So it's created a bit of two. Turmoil yeah. in the industry, but uh, you know the big players have, have all have all adopted and gone up there. But some of the other players have thought, oh, 
Does it apply to 12 volt? Uh, is it 12 volt and 240? Should it apply to, to thermoelectric products? We only just got a ruling recently that it doesn't apply to thermoelectrics. Only that was only revised uh, about two or three months ago. It applies to compressor fridges only, and it doesn't apply to absorption. So oh. there are some still some uh, companies out there. I think need to need to look at whether they've met the AT flammability re- requirements and. Uh, and changing on the on the plastic materials that they use. Yeah, right. Cool. Worth asking that question. All new to me, but I'm going to shoot you a couple of really quick questions that came up in that section for for some quick clarification, and then I want to talk about the design, um, like your sure. design process. So, first one, you mentioned duty cycle. How often do Dometic fridges run a duty cycle? Yep. So, so we've got about 10, 10 duty cycles an hour. So it's it's gonna it, it's gonna come on and have a look. At, um, at what the temperature is. So the, the, the controller is going to switch the fridge back on, not run the compressor. It's going to have a, have a look at what the thermistor is saying the internal temperature is, and the thermistor is offsetting to measure the temperature of the fridge at what we call centre centre. So if you imagine the centre centre from, from the, uh, at, at mid height of the basket, yep. not at the bottom corner, not at the top, centre centre, and it's going to see whether your fridge has moved up half a degree or one or two degrees more than you've actually set the temperature to. Mm-hmm. Then if that is, if it hasn't, it's just going to stay in stasis mode and about 10 minutes later or seven and a half minutes later, it's going to come and have a look and see if it's back on again. But the moment it sees the temperature move, it's going to spin back up, yep. spin the compressor up using VMSO, yep. and it's going to try and bring that temperature down and it will when, when the compressor is running it'll turn off and traditionally the circulation of the cool air in your fridge will notice maybe it drops down one or half a degrees more cooler than you've actually set it to and then it'll step back up to there and yep. then it'll, it'll just continue that duty cycle but of course if in the duty cycle it never reaches back down to the temperature because it's got no ventilation, because it's in very high ambience, it, it's going to it run all running. the time. Yeah. And that's where you're going to end up with the problems because in 32 degrees ambient, you're going to get the duty cycle no problem at all. Yeah. Right. In 40 degrees ambient, you're going to start to get to the problem where many fridges are going to start to run yep. all, of the, all of the time. Yeah. And that's where instead of meeting the standard power draw that you see, You'll you're going to have – a, a much bigger effect on the product if it can't maintain its duty cycle on the on the energy consumption. Awesome, okay. thermoelectric coolers for people who are not really sure mm. what the difference is. Can you give us a quick rundown on that? Yeah, so so the compressors allow you to run as a fridge or freezer or fridge and freezer if you have dual zones, very much like your like your home fridge in a ch- in a chest chest style instead of an upright style. Yeah. Uh, but thermoelectric is a different technology that was developed for NASA so that the uh, the astronauts could have um, some cold drinks and some hot meals yeah, without right. any flames or anything like that. So all it is it, it's a ceramic block called a Peltier, and you put positive energy positive energy or positive power through or negative power through, and it can do hot and cold. But the limitations of a Peltier, it can get up to about 65 degrees hot, but it'll only get down to two degrees cold. So it can never okay. be a freezer. It, we, we call them cooler warmers is the way we would, we would describe a okay. thermoelectric product. So, so there are a few of them out there. We do, we do a range in the TCX range. There's been some little, little TBO8s. But sometimes people buy these little thermoelectrics expecting to have compressor fridge performance. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. if you want compressor fridge performance, you're not going to be paying $109. Yeah, so for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. No, that's, um, it has come up before of people purchasing them not quite realising what they are. So yeah. it's a good um, point of clarification. Now, Should I know we- that I'm like probably doing most of the talking here, Benji, and asking most of the questions. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so apologies if you don't want to hear my voice anymore, but you're going to hear it for a bit longer. <laughs> so um, it <laughs> hasn't yeah. been too long a time since we've seen the CFX3s. And I know you mentioned earlier in the um, in the interview that your sort of design cycle as a whole is around five to six years. So yeah. it's not yeah. going to be um, – it's another couple of years away before we see something new from you guys. But talk us through – Dometic's process from the very sort of beginning of design conception through to the end user's hands? You, you wouldn't believe it. We have an actual process called DPDP, which is <laughs> the, the Dometic product design process. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we actually have a, we actually have that as a thing. So it, it's quite an, it, it, it's, it's, it's a toll gated software program that runs in Antura, uh, which some, some manufacturers would, would know about. And we, we run that, run that process. It starts basically with this understanding, as I said, in product management, the life cycle of the product. 
we then take where the trends are going and what we need to do to meet the demands of the consumers. So one of my roles, and I get the sales guys from the Dometic side to help me here, is to get the feedback from the consumer. And any feedback is is uh, is always helpful. Just had some Facebook feedback from our, our website, some Instagram feedback on what people would like to see in products. So anything that comes through your show, we're always keen to find out what the new USP features and benefits that people are looking for. Yep. You know, I think the jury might be out on on app control. I think it's a it's a nice to have whether mm. people are using the app control when they can just touch the button at the fridge. Well, you know, I'm not sure. Do we need to dial that out so people can control their fridge from a further distance? I think the monitoring of power is really is really the component there of app control. But all these features and all the new things that happen, we start to put together. We then form. The, the first part the first part of that is is the book of requirements is how we start a new project we say right here's the book of requirements this has to be these extra feature sets need to meet these performance parameters these cost parameters these these production values and we start with a book of requirements then if that's passed by the uh, by the product board in Dometic we then get we get to the next stage we start to uh, we start the next part of the DPD process which is to do the finances we get commitments globally um, from all the sales companies in Dometic about which products they what they want to buy what volume they're going to take, what the what the pricing is going to be, and then then we do a business case. Then we submit a business case to finance, and then we start the design process. Then we then we then we the factories go out. We we start the the work on sourcing which compressor we're going to use. We then start with uh with the production and uh, tooling. Once we've got the permission to do the the tooling value, which can scare the bejeebas out of uh, out of sometimes when you yeah. when you're buying three million dollars US of tooling, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a big in, in investment to to step into. And you you get your tooling, you, you start you start um d- d- doing your products. We start to prototype very early and uh, machine compartments. We do a lot of a lot of pre-test. So there's a there's quite a regime that's built into the DPD process of doing your your, your pre tests and uh, and doing your field testing on the products. Um, for example, when we originally did the CFX product, we put the running gear into some older models and sent a hundred of these around Australia and had them bashed around for six or eight months mm. to find out anything before we before we actually put them into the, the CFX. Yeah, so nice. there's this background. There's background prototyping or background work sometimes being done with the uh, with the compressor technology and field testing. But the reality is, because we're quite advanced within the machine compartment already on the compressor, the VMSO controllers, the style of the way that we do them, we're not really recreating the wheel. We're trying to improve the spec and performance in in each level of that, and and do our due diligence on the testing. So we then do the do the field testing. We then go to um, uh, pre-production on prototypes. Then we start, you know, at some stage, uh, probably this year, we'll see some people, some of our sales guys coming out to you with some prototypes or some uh, off-tool samples. So we get to that that level of off-tool samples. Th- then we get to the engineering samples, and they're always being sent around to the the products and the product development engineers all over the place in the world for their feedback and their yeah. testing and their remarks. So the project is is. A, a life cycle of its own. Traditionally, on the big projects, there's a weekly project meeting globally, and people are giving their feedback to to get to that sound. And then we, when, when we finally push the push the uh, the, the button on our toll gate four, we're actually at product realization. We're about to start the machines rolling and start pumping out pumping out the first batch of whatever one thousand, two thousand, three thousand, ten thousand, whatever we punch out. Yeah. Then we have a uh, an early warning process for those first ten thousand units that come off the production line we're monitored very very closely on um on um uh, any, any warranty any any things that go wrong with it and and uh the early warning programs is being run at the moment on a new release that we did last october we launched in the mid in the uh in the better uh, category the CFF 12, so the 12 litre console cooler with the two yep. cup holders at the front. Yep. We released that in October last year, so that's being monitored globally to see if there's any uh, any issues with that. And I can say for Australia, uh, after the uh, after significant sales since last year, fourth. Not one <laughs> warranty so on the list of That's great. That's so so good. far, I mean, you, usually somebody's done something we'd want to bring it back in for a warranty or repair, but I've, I've searched our entire database, spoken to the service department managers, and we haven't seen one come back yet to give That's any cool. feedback to the factory early to mm. see if there's anything we need to improve in the production line. Oh, then uh, six months after release, 
we do a lessons learned. So we do a deep dive into what lessons were learned in that whole project. And then the beginning of the first project, part of the Tollgate 1, is to review those lessons learned so okay. n- n- none of that knowledge is lost. So Sounds the like DPDP a... process for Dometic is Solid. the same process for mobile cooling, upright refrigeration, RV, everything, and it's fairly detailed and fairly yeah. involved. Sounds like That's, it. Um, good to know. You mentioned um, that you have sort of quite early on in the process, you scope out your financial commitment globally and things like that, but that's purely off the book of requirements. So obviously you're relying on your your brand's credibility and that trust in, in Dometic for people to financially back a project that they realistically haven't seen yet. So that's yeah. – um, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, that's an awesome yeah. process. So, so, so the backing is coming from from within within the Dometic Group itself. So the finance is coming there. The commitments for the IRBC are Dometic sales companies okay. committing that they're going to come to Snowy's and sell X amount of this new model. Yeah. They're going to go to REI in America and sell this amount of mo- models. They're yep. going to go to some of the big RV dealers in Europe and sell this amount of models. So we get a, an indication of the volume and uh, and yeah, okay. what, what what we're going to do to 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 make the business case work for Dometic because you know I'm vying for Dometic's money for mobile cooling, but my 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 peers are vote are wanting Dometic money to spend on refriger- uh, yeah, yeah. Right, refrigeration and yeah. and, and and motor home <laughs> doors and tents exactly yeah. right tents yeah, and yeah. flats yeah exactly so we're all vying for a big bucket of money so I try to put the biggest business case forward with it to, <laughs> to say give it to us in mobile cooling yeah for sure hey, I um, think- let's jump on to uh, listening, listening questions, questions. Yep. yeah so we'll um we'll try and fire through these so lauren asked uh i think you've got a list of questions okay. there but asked them on our um youtube and and facebook channels sure um so starting with dual zones mm. uh, the best temperature setting to run either fridge and freezer and then the best setting if it's just also just fr- just fridge and fridge. So I think they want to know just what are what are the most efficient. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what are the correct, the correct yeah. set temperatures? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just before I answer that, just so you're aware, within the Australian marketplace, we see uh, two styles of dual zones in the marketplace. We used to do the old style, which is called a spillover, where you have where you have the evaporate evaporator lamellar plate on one side of the fridge, and then some dividers, and the cold creates a freezer area and then spills over. Which you, technically isn't some, a dual zone, is it? Really? Like, yeah. let's be honest. It's 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 a spillover, and you can create a frozen compartment and a fridge compartment. So I won't argue whether it's a dual zone because we definitely <laughs> use spillover and called our old eighties and one ten dual zones. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to okay. be drawn on that okay. one, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> I would say you can use them as a freezer and a fridge using the dividers and setting the temperature to minus fifteen or minus eighteen. You need to run. You need that. That's what people didn't understand. It only had one temperature control because it was running one compressor mm. and one lamellar plate to spill onto the fridge side. You had to on those old models run the uh run the freezer side as minus 15 or minus 18 to get two or five degrees in the fridge side and that's what people didn't understand they're running the running it at minus eight and wondering why the fridge side was never cold and the freezer never 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 got done so that was that was the spillover method we haven't done spillover in the dometic business for for getting on for 10 years now we've now moved to what we what we developed and what we wanted to do in our CFX range was create a dual zone, one compressor, bivalve split system. What does that mean, Paul? The compressor is running the valve in the center, which which splits which way it's going to go. It'll right. always default most of the cooling to the freezer compartment first. It'll make the freezer cool first. Then it'll make the, the, the fridge compartment cool. So it balances it out. Once it's reached temperature, it goes into its normal duty cycle, and off it goes monitoring both fridge and freezer temperature. Okay. But that's that's what you would call your genuine fridge freezer. The beautiful thing about that is a little bit like your 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 your, your, your uh, consumer thinkers wonders question from Facebook is is that is that um, you, you can do it any way you want to with with a bivalve split system in the Dometic CFXs. You can use one side as a freezer, one side as a fridge. Both sides is minus twenty two degrees freezers. Both sides is fridges at two degrees for beer, five degrees for food, or better still, have a five degree food fridge. And a two degree beer fridge. You can have any combination you want. And with the control mechanism on the CFX, you can actually switch one compartment off and wipe it out, use it for dry storage, run the other side as fridge or freezer. So the flexibility 
of having a dual zone mm. just doesn't mean freezer and fridge. People don't necessarily understand that you can turn a compartment off, run as fridge or freezer, or run both sides as fridge and both sides as fridge. I think that's really important that when you're looking for a product that's a dual, that's a dual zone with a bivalve split system, that it can do all of those things. Okay. Which will lend you towards the CFX3, I would hope. So, <laughs> so and is, and is, there a, setting, is there a magic temperature then? Yeah, as far as setting temperature, the, 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 the right thing to do is if you want to save as much power as possible, you can run happily run your fridge compartment at five degrees. Mm-hmm. We do our testing at four degrees. If you want really cold beers, you'd probably go at two. So that's that's how you go. If you're just running food only, five degrees. If you're running a freezer and everything in your freezer you are going to eat on your holiday or on your trip, you can just run the freezer at minus eight. And we call that a holdover freezer. So when you're running it at minus eight, you need to consume that food. You can't refreeze it if you haven't if you haven't used it. So that will save your power because you're running, you know, four or five degrees mm. and you're saving minus at minus eight as a holdover freezer. Mm. But traditionally the setting should be, and this is how we test it, is plus four degrees Celsius in the fridge compartment minus 15 degrees Celsius in the freezer compartment. Okay. Minus 15 is enough, more than enough to keep everything froze, frozen. Right. Minus 18 is is really a deep freeze. If you're deep freezing fish for a long period or you're deep freezing things that you want to get to, to there. Ours will go down to minus 22. It's a little bit of showing off. We mm. go to minus 22 in the freezer, but between minus 18 and minus 22, Not there's, a huge amount there's of essentially no difference. Yeah. You know, you, you've got to get to minus 72 degrees Celsius before you can make dry ice. So there's <laughs> nothing there. <laughs> Running that. it at minus 22 is just showing off how good your batteries are, to be brutally honest. Yeah, right you don't need to go below minus 15 or minus, minus 18. You can go there, but you don't, you don't need to. So it's about balancing what your usage is against the temperatures that you're going to go out. But we recommend for a dual zone, Minus 15 for freezer and four degrees for fridge. That's enough to keep your food just right and your and your beers icy cold. If you nice. want to tweak it down a bit more, you can do that. I, I, I like my beers icy, icy cold. So I run it, I run it two in my fridge and minus 15 in my freezer. All right. Good one. So Wanda's got a couple of prongs in her overarching questions about dual mm. zone. So in terms of ec- um, running your fridge economically, Chocking it up right to the to the lid or half full? Is there like a capacity? Yeah, yeah. So 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 the, the reality is is it if it's if it's got for fridge especially, if it's got uh the the fuller it is, the better it is. But when I say that, that's if it's already been chilled yep. down to fridge temperature. Yeah. Yep. So because the fridge is going to work at its maximum to take the heat out of products that you put in. Yeah. If you're putting something in at ambient temperature, that's nowhere near as good performance as putting it in at the fridge. And that's why we tell everybody, and I'm sure your users would be, and your viewers would be aware of that, what you want to do is a day before your trip is to plug your fridge into 240 volt yep. mm-hmm. and chill it down with the goods you're taking already in there yeah. to get it down to a nice cool temperature, which means you're starting off, your, your, your 240 volt has done all the work. Yeah, it's that's got what your we do fridge too, yeah. already pulled down and it's already taken all the heat out of the products that you've put in your fridge compartment. Yep. But once they're at there at ambient at um at cold temperature, they're gonna be it's gonna draw a lot less power to hold it at that. If you keep and you have to when you're camping, if you keep putting warm stuff in, mm. you're always gonna be making the fridge work harder because it's gonna that, that's gonna affect the uh, the internal slightly and it's gonna cut it's gonna set the duty cycle off and it's gonna come on to to cool to cool it down. So capacity wise, if you've got a large mass already in there that's already chilled down, it's gonna have the 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 most the most uh, effect on reducing the power draw. A little bit like when you're using blocks of ice. You don't use little blocks of ice, you use one big block yeah, big for long, longevity. So yep. if you think about it in that principle, having a having a larger volume of goods already chilled will save you the power. Uh, and she's also asked um, uh, something along the lines of whether or not it's possible for the fridge to draw too much from the battery, but then sort of clarified that she's getting random and, and inconsistent load rate reading. So I feel like potentially you've already answered a lot of that throughout the interview already in terms of, you know, your ambient temperatures and making sure you have accurate ventilation and what you're putting in your fridge and how much you're filling it up. But in terms of the power draw of the fridge if it is drawing more than you would expect it to, is that generally an indication that something might be wrong? 
Yeah, very seldom it, it, it could be, but in most cases it's about ventilation and ambient temperature. Sometimes it, it may well be that in the process it, a compressor might be overgassed, but that's so infrequent it's, a, yeah. it's not there. And we'd like to have a look at it. If ventilation is good, ambient temperature is good, and it's drawing too much too much power, then we'd like to have a look at it. People make this mistake, and I've seen people do a fridge test and make this mistake. You, you, I think your consumer here has talked about inconsistent load readings. So to me, that gap means one thing. So you probably put a, a load meter or a clamp meter on the wire and is measuring the power draw. But, of course, the power draw needs to be measured accurately over an hour because of the duty cycle. Okay. So when the compressor is spinning, it's going to use five and a half, six, four amps an hour. Four amps. It's going to show it on the on mm-hmm. the on the clamp meter or the voltage meter. But mm-hmm. of course, it's not going to run for the whole hour. It's yeah, only going to run like a for a period it takes to to yeah. cool it down. And as yeah. we said, when it's a thirty two degree ambient and you're running the fridge at four, it's going to come on ten times in the hour or so, and it's going to it, it's going to run for maybe one or two minutes at five or five or six amps an hour, and then it's not going to run for the whole hour. But okay. the average over the hour is going to be about one amp an hour. So if she's talking about inconsistency of low readings, and I don't know what what um, what uh, device she's using, it could well be. I saw a, uh, a South African fridge test where the gentleman was putting a clamp meter on the wire to the fridge and couldn't understand why one fridge was showing nothing and another fridge was showing 5.6. Well, it's just a duty cycle. One yeah. fridge is yeah, running, right, okay. one wasn't. But unless you've measured it over the hour, you, you, you don't know because yeah. that would be inconsistency to load readings. I think that might be Wanda's answer. Wanda, you can let me know if that's not, but we're happy yeah, to, happy yeah. to talk, On a Facebook talk to you about it, about it any, anyway. But we talked about those test conditions there as well, about yeah. what, it, what it should be and what it would do because we know that's independently tested certified in in the in the in the in the labs that, that that's what it should be doing cool all right now lynette's asked um uh lynette's a, a compact camper um a question on draw fridges and why there isn't a draw fridge that you can stand bottles in um even mm. a one liter uht bottle are there limitations with draw fridges yeah, yeah. In their design? there are and i and interestingly, drawer fridges don't fit into mobile cooling. They fit into our upright division. So uh, okay. another friend of mine, another product manager, Sam, looks after that. But I can speak to drawer fridges for, for him for him anyway. So the, the, the limitation with, with drawer fridges is the reason we, we do chest fridges is, is the, natural, the natural physics of thermodynamics. Cold comes down. So when you're opening a lid on a chest fridge, you're not losing all the cold out of your out of your fridge. When you have an upright fridge, the moment you open your door of your upright fridge, all your colds come out of the bottom. The moment you open a drawer fridge, the cold's going to come out of the sides. And the difficulty with drawer fridges is the integration of the slide system into the insulation of the walls. Okay. So you're reducing your ability to insulate the walls. You have a slide mechanism built in there, and as you're opening it, all the cold's going to come down the sides from underneath the slide and drop out the bottom very much like it does on your upright refrigeration. So the first limitation for for drawer fridges is for them to work properly. That's why they're never a freezer. All our drawer fridges are always designed as fridges because you have to have really thick insulation and you'd be too big for your for your capacity of what you can do for drawer fridges. So so it's about the design and what you can and can't do with the drawer fridge is, is the reason we don't really get into it. We do a we do a 20 litre and we do we do a 30 litre. And also because of the native of the, the nature of the insulation properties, having to build the slide mechanism into the wall, all of that sort of stuff. It means it ends up drawing more power yeah, than okay. a than a compressor fridge for the equivalent side would be if it's in a in a chest chest design. So a lot of people think that a uh, a draw fridge is an effective answer, and for fitment, I understand where they're coming from. Yeah. I absolutely under understand where where they're coming from. And is there a, the ability to put a UHT one liter in there? You're starting to get to maybe a, a forty, uh, you know, that that sort of height and that sort of when I mean, you sort of depth. You're talking about a, a forty liter draw fridge, and then you're starting to think, mm, is that going to fit into a draw slide system? Is that going to fit in yep. into a truck cab? Is that going to fit yeah. into an RV or a minivan? It starts to get a bit large once you've gone up because. From a dimensional perspective, if you've gone to fit a one-litre milk bottle height that way, 
your length and your width is going to be quite long. Mm. And you, so it looks like a, an octag- octagonal or a rectangle or a uh, sorry, a rectangle, not an octa- octagonal. And uh, and you, you're going to end up with thicker insulation properties. So you're going to end up with a product that may be difficult for uh, from a fit- fitment point of view. But I think I, I'm not sure if there's some other companies that do have a a draw fridge that are, that are going to be able to put a, a, a generally one liter not. We've sort of, of we've yeah, we've investigated yeah. it and they're all pretty low. So, but, but what you say <laughs> makes perfect sense. Like yeah, they, does, they are yeah. quite handy for fitment, and that's the that's probably the main thing. But yeah, opening that drawer and, and the cold air coming um, out. I know this is list and question segment, but I'm just going to slide in with my own personal question here. So in our system, we're currently using like a, a quite a large um, 80, 90 litre dual zone fridge that mm-hmm. pulls out on a slide. Obviously it's yep. massive, it's heavy, the slide is huge, whatever. So I thought in our next van down the track, it'd be cool to stack two draw fridges and run one as a freezer and one as a fridge because then you offset having to use a draw slide and whatever and you still get large capacity. But potentially what you're suggesting to me is that might not be a Yeah, I think, I think you'd be struggling to find a draw fridge that, that can maintain freezer. Okay, cool. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Appreciate I think that. I, I, we, we, we certainly don't produce one. We rate our draw fridges yeah. at, 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 at two degrees. Okay. Yeah, they will get in a colder ambient. They'll get down to minus five, no, no problem. But the net, yeah, to, to maintain consistency of freezer, we, we set a standard where you have to be at minus fifteen and thirty two. You got to, okay. you've got to, you've got to be able to get down to minus fifteen in a, in a freezer compartment. And and the technology, yeah, you, theoretically you could do it, but it'd be a bulky unit, yeah. Okay. And then then you've you've defeated the purpose of the drawer in the first place from yeah. a fit point of view. Okay, good point. So just some general quick fire questions. Otto on YouTube. Wants to know if can the CFX range be used for a home freezer? He said he found the lid shrank, never heard of that before, from the cold and allowed ice to form around the seal. The seal became compromised and I had to regularly defrost the unit. Any tips or tricks? Yeah, I think I think probably probably what that is. I mean, these are designed as camping fridges, and sure, you can use them all year round and they they're fine being used all year round. But if you're running them all year all year round as a freezer, they don't have the, the older models don't have the anti defrost technology of the newer models do. Right. So I think your your gentleman's got a a a, uh, a a original CFX or a CF or or the CFXW uh, that didn't have the anti condensation coil. So what we did to 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 stop that effect because we noticed more and more people are using them as 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 adjunct or annex freezers in their in their uh, in their backyards or in their in their sheds for the leftover Christmas gears when they're not away four wheel driving. So what we did is understanding that we put an anti condensation coil using the return heat mm. from the uh, from the compressor tube to go through the top of the uh, of the lip system. Them, and that stopped that anti condensation, so that doesn't happen on the CFX three. On okay. the older models, if for a long time use, you're going to have the seal compressed down, and if you're running it as a freezer, any of humidity is going to get captured and uh, and go from there. So if it's high high ambient humidity, that will be that. But they they were never designed to be a chest freezer at home with anti condensation coils yeah, yeah. put in them. But yep. suddenly we've realised many many people are using them as a home freezer. And use them all year round, mm. so that's why we've actually improved the CFX three to have the anti condensation coil. So, so sorry for that for that reader, but uh, mm. invest in a CFX three if you want to use a full drive camping product as a as, as a, a freezer for long term. Hopefully, that answers your question, Otto. So, Mick from YouTube, I love my CD thirty, but why did Dometic not put some sort of divider system in to stop larger items from being lodged behind the thermostat? Mm. I, I will have to defer that question to Sam. I, I think. I think again, it's about building building the properties of of that insulation and how we'd actually put a put a divider in it. And in a divider, how how easy would it be to reach in behind it, depending on where your, where your fitment was? I know that thermostat sits off in the right hand corner, and I do do understand what the what the consumer is saying. But if if you pack, if you thought those items that are difficult to get to, if you pack them on the left hand side away from the thermostat, I think it'd be just a question of of packing it in a in a, in a way that makes sense to access those large, larger items. If you lay them down at the front, perhaps rather than tuck them around the back the back corner. But uh, I, I, they haven't really done development on those CD thirties or CD twenties for dividers. But I'll take that on notice and I'll ask the question of the of the product uh, product manager for that for that. Cool. Uh, area uh, we'll and get an answer for you. Loop around Thanks, and get Paul. an answer to you, mm. uh, Mick. And last one, uh, Andrew on YouTube says, "Where's the best, or where is it best to store your fridge when camping, if not in the car?" 
Yeah. The, the, the difficulty, of course, is when, you, when you're in your car and you're locked up, leave your windows open for security. If you, if you can always, if you can have it out in the air, of course, shade, you want to park in the shade, you want to give it the, your fridge every best chance. So, so keeping it in the shade in your campsite is, is the best answer to that one. But again, if you're worried about security, how you secure it, padlock, padlock through the, uh, through the chain to secure it to something else, might, through the handle might yep. might be your option there. But the good thing is for security wise, if it is on a fridge slide, you've got the nut inserts underneath that you can put a security nut in there as well and actually secure it down to your slide so people can't seal it off your slide. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then you've got to think about fridge locks and mechanisms to stop people taking stuff out of it. So so I, I'm not sure exactly what the the, the edge of Andrew's question was but about storing it. Uh, fridge when camping, uh, I guess. I guess you, it's it's your convenience factor. If it's not in the back of your car, at your campsite, next to your barbecue or whatever. But I'm I'm more concerned about Andrew's question about when he's going out doing something. He's not near his fridge, mm. and whether he's worried about security. Outside yeah. of that, I guess our recommendation would be under shelter, like not sitting out in the rain under under an annex yeah. protected from the elements. Which actually, I yeah. know we said that was the last question. I know we've been running for a long time, but I really want to shoot this one to you because it's one we get often through websites. Mm. What's the verdict um, in terms of having them in the back of your ute permanently mounted? I mean, you know they're not, you know, waterproof and all that sort of jazz, but you do see people getting around without yeah, yeah. a canopy. Yeah. So, what's the go there from your perspective? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't. They are not. They are not waterproof. They have an IP rating within within the uh, with uh, IP sixty five on the controller, but you can't have an IP rating for something that's ventilated. Yeah, yeah. So you're never going to get an IP rating because you can't. It, dust, dust, and water can always go into the machine compartment, and that's the, that's going to be the weakness with any product. We, we make them so that if if you know if if fresh water gets in there, if dust and dirt get in there, you can you can make sure they're unplugged. They can be blown out of a service agent. They can clean them up and do that sort of stuff. They're not going to fail directly unless there's a fair bit of water getting in there. But we don't we don't warrant the product to be waterproof or water resistant. That's none of those fridges are waterproof or water resistant. They have an IP rating and you can't you can't have an IP rating when you have ventilation. Yeah. We haven't invented it. Nobody's invented something that's uh, that, that's able to breathe <laughs> with with its current yeah, its yeah, current yeah, air yeah. climate and cir- circulate the air. But we have people that have them on the backs of the Utes for years and years and years. No never issues. have a problem. Yeah, okay. have, have a problem. We have other people that have them on the back of the Ute. And so, something might something might short short out on it, and we say, well, no worries. If you need to keep it, that that things, we, we, if it's if it's been if it's been in direct fl- torrential rain and it's been going straight into the into the machine compartment, that then it's not going to be under warranty. But we can, yeah, it's not never too hard to fix. We we, yeah. we just fixed one that was submerged sub- sub- uh, controller in salt water the other day. Just change the controller <laughs> over, oh, it's fine. Me. But if you're going to do that, just keep your ventilation towards the back of the cab, yeah. so it's not got direct things on there but I, I i saw a saw saw a setup of a guy of a cf50 on the back of his ute uh up in uh up in uh, uh port headland about about a month ago and i said mate don't you have any trouble it was filthy dude, and you covered mm-hmm. in mud and he goes no nah, it's been sitting there for 15 years <laughs> yeah, right. that's awesome <laughs> that's excellent I mean, that's all our questions i think i've learned a heap about to many and, I, and i'm sure that's um Given our viewers a really good insight into the, into the brand and the, and the fridges and everything that goes into the fridges that you uh, you guys put into the market, um, you can check out the range on our website snowies.com.au. Paul, we really appreciate your time today. Um, tons of information. Sounds like you've got like that's just a portion of how much genetic inside information your inside <laughs> inside your brain. Um, if we've got if anyone's got any questions, let us know and we'll see if we can um, get Paul to, yeah. to uh, fire him our way and um, on the Facebook group or yeah, on, on the YouTube group. But uh, Thanks so much for joining us, Paul. And thank you for having me on the show. Really appreciate that, Lauren. Thanks, Ben. I'll, I'll get back to you on that uh, on that divide on the CD30 question. Yeah. But if any other questions come up, happy to happy for you to shoot them through, and you can put them in the in the chat or whatever whatever you need to do. And we're always always open for uh, for good ideas and feedback of what what people are looking for and what they really want in the next generation of fridges that we're going to release. Thanks, awesome. everybody. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Paul. All right, that was a long episode, but heaps of info. Cool. Yeah. There um, wasn't, there, you know, there wasn't even a chance to sort of stop or really have a breather, was there? Like it was jam-packed. Heaps of info. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Loved it. Well, as usual, um, subscribe by YouTube, uh, join in the conversation at the Snowy's, Snowy's Camping Show Facebook group, Yep. if that's what it's still called, uh, and we'll get answers to you. But uh, cool. otherwise, we'll see you next time. Catch you next Thanks week. Thanks for joining us. Bye.